welcome to episode number eight of Table Talks. I'm so excited to be here joined by my friends, ready to have a really nice you conversation. Uh, before we start, we have one added guest, and I'd like to uh, kind of give him a welcome, everybody. Uh, this is Pastor Richard. He's the pastor of the Spanish uh, ministry. You want to say hello? You want to say hi? Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here. He's also my father-in-law, so he's extra, <laughs> extra cool uh, for that. Uh, married to his wife, Natalie, and we have a daughter together. You're married so. to his daughter, his daughter, Natalie. Yeah, Natalie. Yeah, that would be weird if you're married to his wife. Oh, no, married to my, my wife is Natalie. And we have a daughter. But she is our Natalie. Yeah, she's our Natalie. Yeah, yeah. sorry about that. My wife is Natalie. Sorry, Natalie. Not Alexa. That would be weird. All right. We'll jump in. Before we do, I want to thank you guys for coming in every, every month and having this conversation. We do a lot of stuff online. We have services, uh, we had the Lens series, a whole bunch of stuff going on. And at church on Sunday, when people come up to me, they say, thank you for the online stuff and table talks. They always cool. mention table that's talks. That's awesome. So that's yeah. pretty cool yeah. that people are actually watching and enjoying it and uh, getting to know you guys and getting to learn a little bit. You know, we all mm -hmm. uh, are learning together. So that's pretty cool. Uh, shall we jump into our first sure. question? And this is the first time this has happened. We have a very specific question for a very specific person here. It's for Pastor Ken. Um, and I'll say the name because I'm sure she would appreciate it. Joanna is asking, uh, Pastor Ken, how long do you look at yourself in the mirror at Starbucks when you go in to get your refresher? I would first of all say that Joanna Brio is steeped in sin. She is steeped in sin with this question. But Joanna, it, this, long story short, as long as it takes me to look in the mirror and think, how much longer do I have to put up with Joanna Brio? I kind of stare about that long. And then I'm so that's, that's my short answer. Great answer. <laughs> Moving on to our first real question. If you could trade places with anyone in the world, maybe living or, or dead, assuming that person would still be alive, right? Somebody cool. Who would it be? My, my, I got a, my Bible character would be someone like Paul to, or Peter to experience Jesus. My I thought about uh, this possible question today, and I thought I'd like to be Pastor Richard for one day because I would like to speak Spanish fluently <laughs> so, and understand it. So I pray that one day I'm there. So I would like to be Pastor Richard for one I day. I speak Spanish fluently, too. I want to be like Pastor Richard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, <good. laughs> that's fair. <laughs> I think my answer is somewhat similar because my first thought was I would like to be trade places like with Natalie Grant or... Um, Carrie Underwood, somebody who has an incredible singing voice and mm. I can just belt praises to God and not worry about what comes out. I know, I know, I know that do in you heaven, worry about what comes God, out? I do. <laughs> when I'm singing, it's not beautiful. So um, I would love to be able to, I always say, when I get to heaven, I am going to sing beautifully. Go. That's going to be something. Yeah. Good answer. I would take over leadership of the Dallas Cowboys for Jerry Jones. There you go. He's the GM and the owner, and I'd make some moves. That's what I did. <laughs> make some stuff happen. Yeah, we, we win next year. That's right. Looks like you've thought about this a lot, quite a bit. Since I was five years old, actually. Yeah. <laughs> How about nice. you, Mariano? Pastor Richard, what would you say? Uh, I will say Messi. Yeah. Yeah, play some soccer. The, yeah, the greatest soccer ever. Because I, I want to feel how how it feels like to play soccer, like to be the best ever. So, <laughs> yeah, play for Barcelona. That'll be the best day. <laughs> if I have to change, be Pastor Ken. We, we can. <laughs> 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 I'm ready. I'm ready. Hey, go. on a Sunday <laughs> you can wear a white shirt. <laughs> And he preaches in English, and then Pastor Ken comes in yeah. with the suit and tie, <laughs> preaching Spanish. I'm ready. Boom. I'm ready. Nobody will know. Well, we'll know the difference. That's right. Nobody will know the difference. Yeah. Nice. Good answers. Uh, Johnny. See, for me, have I talked about Shrek? I think I would love to be Shrek. Yeah. <laughs> we did talk about that once. <laughs> to get to hang out with the donkey, yeah. obviously. Uh, donkey. <laughs> just kidding. But that, that was rent. But in all, in all seriousness, I think, I think I would want to be my daughter just to... What, what is she doing all day? <laughs> just hanging out, walking around, falling, hitting things, uh, thinking, uh, taking the Tupperware out and just throwing it everywhere. Nobody tells her anything. Yeah. She just does whatever she wants. So maybe, maybe her. That's <laughs> maybe my daughter. Get to hang out. Uh, all right. Let's go to our next question. We got a little more, more serious here. Um, are baptisms and the Lord's Supper sacraments or ordinances. And before we uh, answer this question or we get into it, maybe we, we explain a little bit of the difference between a sacrament and an ordinance. Um, so does anybody want to jump in and take it? 
um, thinking about the question, if you ask that question to a Baptist brother, for sure he's going to say this is an ordinance. Mm -hmm. If you ask the question to a Roman Catholic, mm -hmm. going to say this is a sacrament. For me, at least for me, it's both. It's an ordinance and it's a sacrament. Why? Because Jesus is the one who say, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's Jesus who said, do this in remembrance of me. Mm -hmm. So in that way, it's an ordinance. So why we believe as a reform, uh, and we use the word sacrament, because we believe that the word sacrament represents or is a sign, is a sign, a visible sign of something that God has already done for us through Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and the cross and the resurrection. And it's a visible sign. The problem is some people have with the word sacrament is that some people believe that the sacrament have some kind of power, that we receive some kind of grace to the sacrament. Mm. And that is what the uh, Roman Catholic and the Orthodox churches believe, there is some kind of power in the water of baptism or uh, in, the, in the bread and the wine, there's some kind of power in that. Well, we don't believe that. We believe there's are, are, are only uh, signs that represent something that has already done for us through mm. Jesus Christ. That's why we use the word sacrament. If we stay only with the word ordinance, uh, in some way, we give some power, or some, we attribute some power to our obedience. It's something that I do for God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In obedience, I do. And I do my part because God has do his right. part. And, uh, and we don't believe that. We believe that we baptize our people, we baptize, we celebrate supper as a, as a way of thanksgiving to God because God has already done. We don't baptize because we want to be saved. We baptize because we, because we are saved. Mm -hmm. We are part of the covenant, mm -hmm. people of the covenant. So it's a sign, uh, as an example, we are Emmanuel Reformed Church, and we have a sign out there who say Emmanuel Church. Suppose some people, some person are looking for the church and see, read the sign, say, oh, Emmanuel Reformed Church, we found the church. But he's staying by the sign. Mm -hmm. He doesn't come inside. He don't worship yeah. with us. He, yeah. don't, he come in every, every Sunday, he's staying in the sign. <laughs> <laughs> he's not a part of the yeah. Emmanuel Reformed Church. He's staying in the sign. But mm -hmm. we, we don't stay in the sign. We believe that the signs represent something. Mm -hmm. That's why we believe there is a sacrament, not only an ordinance. Mm -hmm. That is what, why uh, uh, the best I can explain that. Nice. That well done. Good. Yeah. <laughs> that was really good. Coming in hot. First, right. uh, yeah. first table talks and <laughs> take over. <laughs> <laughs> that was so good. Uh, you guys have anything I, else to I, add or maybe a different, uh, a different example? I, uh, the idea of sacrament, the idea there's a means of grace. And so we don't believe that you are saved by the baptism you are, and you are eating Jesus in the Lord's Supper. But we do believe it's a means of grace, that God is doing something beyond what we know, and it's more than just our human decision, what mm -hmm. we're doing. Mm -hmm. I like what Martin Luther did. So Luther helped start the Reformation. Mm -hmm. He's Roman Catholic, but he wants there to be a reforming. Luther would say over and over again when he was tempted by sin, I have been baptized. Mm -hmm. I have been baptized. Something was done to me. Something was done for me, beyond me. So I appreciate Pastor Richard's answer, and we're not Roman Catholic, and we're, and we, and we're not Baptists, and we respect. Mm -hmm. But uh, somehow there is a means of grace. Somehow God is at work, but Reformed people have more of the mystery in it and not um, we completely understand it even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, practically speaking, maybe for, for someone that's like, all right, cool, cool story, now, how does that help me in life? Um, what, what would you guys offer? How does a, a, a proper or a biblical understanding of the sacraments uh, help us uh, to, to live life, to be a part of the church? Uh, I'll just share quickly. I feel like uh, that you walk in. I've been baptized. If I was baptized mm -hmm. in a household of faith, mm -hmm. God's actually got, he's, he's, his name is on my head. Mm -hmm. I've been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. God has done something. And when I take the Lord's Supper, 
somehow I'm feeding of the Lord. The Lord is feeding me somehow. Mm -hmm. And so I get strengthened by what God is doing. I'm claimed by the Lord and the Lord's church. That's that's part of what I'd say. Mm -hmm. I remember a, a single mom in our, our congregation. She uh, became a Christian here, and uh, she got baptized here in the two little uh, sons, uh, Adolfo and Ethan. And uh, when I baptized them, in my sermon, I referred to the story of uh, Luther. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm baptized, I'm baptized, mm -hmm. and I say that. So months later, uh, this uh, single mom went through a very difficult time, and one day she was crying. And Adolfo, the oldest one, say, Mom, don't worry, we baptize. We yeah. are baptized. Oh, that's powerful. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, um, thank you for answering that. Let's shift gears a little bit. I'll ask the next, que next question. Um, what would you say to someone who believes that pastors and leaders should just preach the gospel mm. uh, and not speak uh, about the current events and the things that are going on uh, in the U.S. today? Mm. So... We see that a lot in, in the maybe in the comment section on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, pastors and leaders are told, uh, just preach the gospel, preach yeah. the Bible. Uh, don't worry about the current events. Don't worry about the yeah. state of the U.S. Just focus on preaching the gospel and, and you'll be fine. Yeah, I would speak to that. I think when you just flip the pages of the New Testament, you see that Jesus and Paul and Peter were constantly interacting with the people and the current events at that time. Just some... Examples from Jesus when he's talking about taxes and what's on the coin, he flips on both sides and uses what's happening and what was expected of them politically at that time to explain a biblical truth. Pay to Caesar what's Caesar's, give the Lord what's Lord's. I just the other day, Bobby and I read Luke 13, and he was talking about how the blood of the Galileans was mixed with sacrifices and how this weird tower of Siloam fell on people. That was a current event, and he used it to explain a kingdom reality for them. Mm -hmm. Think about Paul writing to Corinth and the church in Ephesus and Galatia, and he's constantly talking about the current events with their relationships within the church and their relationships with the, even the, the Roman establishment in, in mm -hmm. Philippi and how all that worked. So I think, I don't, if you took out the current events from the Bible, I don't know how much would be left, actually, when you look at Jesus bringing the repentance and the believing right. into where these people are actually at. And I think when you look at the Bible, you just see constantly God coming down and meeting people in the midst of their mess, which is oftentimes current events. And so I'm mm -hmm. grateful that that's the case for Scripture, and I think mm -hmm. that's still the case for us today, is where the repenting and the believing in Jesus Christ alone, but it infiltrates every culture. Right. Like Christianity is not just for Mexico or the United States. It's infiltrating current events all over the world. Jody or Mariano, I think you want to add? I would just say, I think, um, I mean, I, I don't think, I know that um, our belief in God, our walking with, with him impacts the way we live and we live in this world. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're a part of what's happening in the world around us mm -hmm. and the our belief in Jesus Christ as a son of God had better impact the way we live. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, those two go hand in hand. So it's just what you said, Clark. I mean, it's, we see it in the Bible, but, um, but it absolutely is relevant today. We need to be looking at the whole big picture. Mm -hmm. So I think it's good. I would say one last thing I would add to though, is when you look throughout history, there seem to be trends of different fads and things that are exciting at the time. One of the things that obviously is constant and continual forever when it comes to the preaching the gospel is the good news of what Jesus Christ mm -hmm. has done. And um, I think getting to that in the midst of whatever language or country you're in, there's only one way in which someone is saved, mm -hmm. and that is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I just celebrate that that is able to infiltrate, he is able to infiltrate yeah. all situations, all languages, mm -hmm. all geographical places, and bring the good news. Something I would just add is that... Um, when you read the Bible, a really unique thing began happening. They first were called Christians in Antioch because all these races were now together in the one body, and mm -hmm. it was shocking. And the outsiders called them Christians because mm -hmm. the black, Latin, Jewish, Greek group was together. How did they make that work? Mm -hmm. And then in Stephen's, the story of uh, we need to get some new deacons here, because the widows from the Greek background are not being cared for. That's a good example. The Greek and the, like, okay, how do we make this work? And so when you gather and you're in Paramount, 
and your church becomes English and Spanish and Nepalese and older and younger and white and black and brown and police officer and the whole range, Mm -hmm. then you've got to talk about things and then you have to keep coming back to the heart of things is we all are people who need to repent and believe in Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, follow him and by the spirit be changed, but address things humbly and learning from each other because we are not an all Dutch, all Latino, Mm -hmm. all black, all police church. We are not. So we have to address it, mm-hmm. and then you have to do it humbly, and you're probably going to make mistakes, but can we love each other and learn, and can we be different than the world and not be this, but we are going upward together with the Lord in our differences mm. and loving each other. Mm. Yeah, do you guys have anything Yeah, to I add? mean, I agree 100%, and I think uh, it is true. Like, And also, I think we have to be careful um, at the same time when we... When, when you're in a, in a platform and people are listening to you and following you, um, you do have to be careful in what, what you share and uh, when you're going to talk about the current event, what is happening. Yes. You have to be very careful you, of not taking any side either or political. And uh, I think a lot of pastors made that mistake this past year, uh, especially because you want to have influence in the people and like you might lose a part if you take a part. Uh, and I think we have to talk about the current events because that's and bring Jesus and bring God and, be, mm-hmm. and bring the word of God to those events. Mm-hmm. I think it, it is a, it is part of what we do. Uh, so just to add, that's a great point. great add. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I think one of the biggest misunderstandings is like what the gospel is, um, and what boils down to is what Clark said is you know the death salvation and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But within that, or outside of that too, there's so much to it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a life that now we're called to live, right? Um, and if a pastor is told, just preach the gospel, you can't do that without being uh, living the gospel, mm-hmm. uh, actually caring for that. And if we look at the words of Jesus, or who Jesus would preach to and talk to and hang out with, is are the people that were in need, mm-hmm. not the people that were A-OK. Yeah. And um, if we've learned something this past year, uh, most of us are not 100% okay. Uh, we all need some help, right? Yeah. Um, and there are people in the U.S. that need more help than others, uh, and that's and that has been clear. Um, so, with that, what is what do you think is one thing the church can do, um, and not just address or talk about, but actually do to help those who might be of some might need some more help in the U.S. today? Um, what are some of the things that the church can actually do and and, and be a part of? Um, and not just address or talk about it, but actually be the hands and feet of Jesus uh, in the U.S. today. So are you talking about like social justice issues uh, kind of a thing? It, it, it really could be anything. Uh, if you want to speak on that, you can. If you want to talk about our actual needs of like, uh, like we have a food bank mm-hmm. and people are actually just helping because a lot of people might have lost mm-hmm. their job due, due to COVID. I'm just very open question to uh, whatever it is that you, you think you'd like to speak on. I feel like um, Emmanuel historically has stepped into a number of areas of here's food each week, here's clothing, um, here's after school, here's English, here's Spanish language. Mm-hmm. There's things we've stepped in. Here's the Compton Initiative. We're painting homes and cleaning neighborhoods. So those are things that have happened. I, I think God would have us in the next three to five years have it go like that mm-hmm. and that we would actually be the place saying, could people learn how to sing here, dance here, act here, mm. English here, Spanish here? Um, I mean, you name it. And in the city of Compton, unleashing thousands of volunteers to how do we love this city? Mm-hmm. Then people often find out who's later on. You, you, Jesus went and he healed people and he, he, he dealt with their, they were hungry. Mm-hmm. He dealt with their needs, but he eventually is calling them to repent and mm-hmm. believe in him. And so it's a both and at the yeah. same time. Yeah. And so I think Emmanuel has done things, and I'm actually praying about the next three to five years, how does that greatly multiply to the glory of God and the joy of the people? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, one of the things that still amazes me to this day about Emmanuel, one of the reasons why, like coming from Phoenix to here and seeing all the things that we're doing is just that, that the, Emmanuel is so invested in the community. And I'm not just saying that because I work at Emmanuel. Like I've seen it, and it's one of the things that, it just drew me in. Say like, all right, they, they love the community. They're a church for the community. And you don't see that on mid size to like really big churches anymore a lot. Uh, so I'm really proud of Emmanuel. So thank mm-hmm. you, Pastor Ken and Pastor Harold and everyone that works here that have laid that foundation for Emmanuel to be 
what Emmanuel is today. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Um, let's move on to our next question. Um, how did you get into ministry? Uh, when did you know that this is what God was calling you to do? Uh, you guys have all been in ministry for a very, very long time. Uh, so maybe you can think back to like, all right, when did I really know? Or when did I feel God calling me to serve? Um, and we say like serve full time, meaning like I'm just fully invested in ministry all the time. I, I mean, I have kind of a story to that when I, um, I mean, I started volunteering in ministry when I was a young girl. So I think by 10 years old, I was serving with my mom in the nursery. By probably 12, I was teaching with my mom, the preschool, Sunday school. Um, and then when I graduated high school, I was uh, volunteering for junior high ministry and then high school mm -hmm. ministry. That's where Johnny and I met. So it's always been a part of our lives. Um, when, so in about in 2000, probably from 2003 to 2005, Johnny and I were serving in our kids club here at Emmanuel because that's where our kids were. And we wanted to get to know the kids and invest in the kids that were their friends. And so we were, um, volunteering there. And then in 2005, um, the last week of July in 2005, I got a phone call and it was from our current student ministries pastor. And he said, you know, Jody, we're starting this new ministry for fifth and sixth graders. And we wanted to know, we're looking for a new director of that ministry. And we wanted to know if you would be that director. And I was mm. taken aback and I said, oh my goodness, um, I'm, thank you so much for calling and asking me, but I'm not qualified. So no, but that was, wow, thank you, <laughs> but yeah. no. And he said, great. That was the only answer we wanted to hear because if you know you can't do it, then you'll trust God to do it through you. We'll call you in a week after you've prayed about it. And I hung up the phone. And I thought, I, I said, no, <laughs> I don't understand what just happened. <laughs> and so um, Johnny and I prayed about it for a week. I, I, I was wrestling. I, I was, it's not out of humility that I say I wasn't qualified. I was not qualified to do the job. So like, how do you say yes to that? but something in me couldn't say no. It mm. was it was God that was just wrestling with me mm. in my spirit. And so we kept praying and we kept praying. And um, in fact, we had gone on vacation with my parents. I did not tell my parents because I did not want them telling me to take the job uh -huh. because I knew I wasn't qualified. How do you say yes to that? Mm. So we got home before I could give a phone call. They um, called me and said, hey, we're doing a pool party for the kids. Just come, bring your family, just come, no pressure. And um, so I have a fun story of God speaking to me in that, but I'll tell that another time. But um, long story short, there I could not say no, and so I said yes. Mm -hmm. And I was concerned about being unqualified. I was concerned about the price my kids were pay, would pay. They were young, the price they would pay for mom going back to work at that season mm -hmm. of their lives. I cannot. T I will get emotional. I cannot tell you the blessing my family has received mm -hmm. because I said yes to God's call and the way that our family has mm -hmm. stepped into ministry, and they don't know any different than that. And so. Um, at cool. The first couple job changes, I said no first, being un because I know I was unqualified. I have never taken a role at Emmanuel Church that I was qualified to take. God will equip you mm. to what He has called you to do, yeah. and so we have to pray about it. You don't take something out of pride. You don't move yeah. into something out of pride. Then you're setting yourself up for failure. But if God is calling you to do something, He will equip mm -hmm. you to do it. And I am a perfect example of that's that. Really that's awesome. awesome. Thank you, Jude. That's, that's my story. That's really good. <laughs> good. Mariano? Yeah. Okay. How you go? <laughs> uh, my parents, were they were doing uh, full-time ministry when I was a kid, so I already knew mm -hmm. since then. Since I was a kid, I knew I was going uh, to be involved in ministry full-time. And when I was 17, after high school, I started. And since then, I've been involved in ministry, and I, I love it. I, I, I had, there, there was, like, a, in Argentina, um, churches, they cannot, uh, not even the pastor, they cannot support the pastor. So you have your job. And you do ministry full time. That's how it is. Uh, so it was see some of my life what I what I will do just a normal job like a self office job and then to serve at the church. And I I just hate it hate it every second of it. Like being in a normal job, I knew that that wasn't my place. Like mm. I, so I would love when I do my my job at church, but then I would hate my my, other, my normal <laughs> job. Monday Friday job. <laughs> uh, so now that I can be fully full time in it is is great and I love it. Is what I always wanted to do. So yeah, I started when I was 17 and so more than 20 years now. Wow. Wow. Cool. I know. Crazy. You just gave away your age. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, Pastor Richard. Um, I don't think I, I remember, I, I can say this is the day when God called me to ministry. What I remember when I was uh, 18 years old, I gave my life to Jesus and say, since that day, 
I started serving in church all the time. Uh, when I married, uh, my, my father-in-law, he was the pastor, and then and he, a uh, few months after uh, we married, he started a church, uh, the first Hispanic church, uh, his, his first, first Nazarene Hispanic church in Toronto, Canada. Oh, wow. So we went to help my father-in-law, and I work all the time, all full-time in church, just teaching Sunday school, uh, doing doing so many things. And, uh, and one day, uh, two or three years after, uh, I was uh, in church, and uh, the superintendent at that time uh, came to me and said, Richard, I need you. And I said, where do you need me? Uh, I need you. We have a church in Brampton, Ontario. Uh, the pastor is no, it's not there anymore, uh, and I need you to go there. And I say, oof. <laughs> and I say, oh, well, let me pray. Let me ask my wife. And my wife say, no, we don't go in there. We're okay here. I say, well, okay. you the boss. <laughs> 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 so a few weeks later, uh, I came early from work, and I started cooking, and a few uh, minutes later, she came, and she was crying, and I say, what? What happened? Why are you crying? Somebody uh, uh, crashed the car or something? And I say, no, no, no. The God speak to me. We need to go there. Wow. Uh, we need wow. to go there. So God's we, the boss. We went <laughs> <Yes>. there. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to the, that church. Mm -hmm. was a church where the pastor, uh, the pastor made a big mistake. Mm -hmm. She, he uh, fall in adultery and all that. So when I, when we, when we, get there to pastor the church was few members left, like five or five, six or five members, old, old people. Oh, and I remember one old man from Peru called Zacarias. Zacarias looked at me and say, I don't know if you can fix what the other pastor makes up. And the other pastor last name was Caballero, like my <laughs> last name. Oh, really? He said, I don't know if he... One caballero can fix what the other caballero <laughs> I said, well, thank you for the encouragement. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> it worked out. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome to church. First day on the job. So, and since there, uh, the first two years, I have to work full time because the church doesn't have any money to support. So I have to work full time for two years and full time pastor, like you say. And after two years, the church say, well, pastor, now what we can, we can, we can bring you. Uh, full time. So, and um, the, uh, at that time, I, I, I talked to my wife and, and I say, well, I need to decide what I want to do. We want to, I want to continue with my company or be pastoring. So we decide just to pastor and I mm. sell everything. And I I'm glad that. you did. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Clark. Yeah, I guess for me, I don't really remember a day or a time where I, I did not know I was supposed to be a pastor. Like that call was just deep in my heart from the time I was a little boy. I remember early in elementary school, you have the day at school, you have to make a poster for what you're going to be when you get older. And yeah, I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to be a basketball player. And I was just like, I'm going to be a pastor. I remember all my teachers being very perplexed of like, what? And I'm like, wow. yeah, I'm supposed to be a pastor. And I actually knew I was supposed to be a pastor here. And so for another time, there are multiple times God confirmed that mm. from when I was probably a second grader, every couple of years, there was a moment from someone, usually I did not know who had a word of the Lord mm. for me in different states and different places. And they would tell me, you're going West. And so, yeah, I'll share those some other time, but I just had it deep in my heart from a young age. I'm supposed to be a pastor. Oh, that's Amen. awesome. I'm glad. Yeah. When I was four, my dad was preaching. And uh, I gave my life to Jesus with my mom after the service. When I was in third grade, the pastor in Orange Sioux Center, I was preaching, and I was in the third, fourth row, and I thought, I'm going to be a pastor while he was preaching. I think children should go to church. Mm -hmm. And then when I was in sixth grade, uh, right before I, we moved out here, my uncle pulled me out of the car and said, you tell them about Jesus in California. So those are my three snapshots, mm -hmm. and, and so I stay in California, Paramount, telling people about the Lord. Yeah. Nice. How about yeah. you, Johnny? I think I, uh, I'm on the same boat with you guys. I, I don't remember a time where I wasn't serving. I've done from stacking chairs to uh, children's ministries to anything that I could think of just to be around church. Yeah. I didn't know why I liked it so much. I don't know why I like hanging out at church so much. I've 
at one point I was helping out like four different churches with their youth ministry, just like running around just because I loved it. I don't know why. But there was a time that I, I can tell where I'm like, all right, I had to make a real adult decision of what I wanted to do. I had a photography business. And then at that same time, my, my brother stopped leading worship because he had to go work. And Pastor Richard um, asked me and he said, you want to come in part time? He said, we can't pay you much and you're going to have to do a lot of work. So, <laughs> and I was like, that sounds fun. <laughs> let me, let me think up. about it. Yeah. 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 So then I prayed and I said, God, if, you, if, if this is what you want me to do, like I'm all in because I love church. I love being around church. And it didn't hurt that Natalie was there, right? And, and, I, and I could be there with her hanging out and stuff. Uh, so I, I prayed and then <laughs> funny thing with prayer, you know, sometimes all the time God answers. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, then I find out that the person that I was with, the, uh, with, uh, with my photography company, they were like stealing money and doing some shady stuff. So I, I said, keep it, like keep the company. I don't care. Like this is where God is calling me to do. Uh, and it was a hard decision for me cause I was making okay money. I just bought a car and just a whole bunch of stuff and I could have grown that company, but I said, you know what? God wants me at church and but then I said God like I'm counting on you to provide because I don't know how I'm gonna make it yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, I've, I mean I was just starting my life I was like 18 20 I can't remember um, and I said God you're you know you're, you're gonna help me uh, I wanted to go to seminary I didn't have any money uh, so I said all right you'll provide so I was there um, and that and that that job was really cool I got to learn a lot from worship leading to like data entry for a daycare that I was really bad at. I was re not making checks and stuff. I was so bad at it. I, I don't know why they gave me that job. I was not qualified for that. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. And probably not called. They, they so. can tell you I was not neither called nor qualified, but I did it. Um, and then it was fully like confirmed when I was like, come to California, do this. You know, God provides and found a way for me to get through seminary. I'm almost done a year left. Out of way. See the light. No debt, nothing. You can see the Just, light. Uh, Full on. So yeah, uh, you know, w when God calls you, he'll, he'll, he'll make a way to mm -hmm. make sure you get, you get what you need to do and, and you get it done. And yeah, it's just happy to be here with you all. So, we are yeah. too. It's been fun. Amen. Yeah, been got fun. a good team. Can I give a closing story yeah. that's important? So we got Pastor Richard and Johnny sitting by each other. Johnny, when did you get married? How many years ago? About three. Three years ago. And they actually asked me to do the first wedding because <laughs> the first wedding, they needed to get married so like all 300 people of the church could come. You can't, have, you can't have a party for 300 people. And then all the, all the relatives need to come for the second wedding, and Pastor Richard's going to do the, the real wedding, and I'm doing kind of the <laughs> civil wedding. And so Natalie's beautiful, isn't she? So yeah. she comes down, and I turn, and I just say, and we're just so grateful for our Natalie. We just are thankful for our Natalie. A week later, Johnny and Natalie are going to make vows again now officially with her dad and all that. And Pastor Richard gets up and in front of all the people goes, I just want to say it's not our Natalie, it's my Natalie. <laughs> so I want you to know I will never, I understand now, I want to understand. That was so fun. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. Is that okay, Johnny, that I told Definitely, you? Definitely, yeah. Right. <laughs> With that, we'll close today. We had one more question. Maybe we'll leave it for next uh, next uh, Table Talks. Um, what's your funniest parenting story? So you have a whole month to come up with a new one. Uh, Clark, I'm sure some crazy stuff will happen in a month. Today. Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> today. <laughs> uh, and thank you all for joining us. Our next, our next Table Talks is going to be on June 7th. It's episode 9. We're so close to episode 10 and catching up to... Uh, the podcast. The 400 podcast. episodes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nearing that century mark, right yeah. on the corner. <laughs> so thank you guys. Thank you, Pastor Richard Mariano yeah. and uh, everyone else for being here and joining us. And to you as well, uh, send us your questions. Um, share this video with your friends, family, whoever. Uh, it's a fun conversation. Thank yeah, you all. And we'll is. see you on June 6th.